Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. I am incredibly amped for this episode. We love paying homage to all the OGs on both sides of the law. And this is one of the great, true uh, mob, you know, one of the greatest mob busters on the East Coast throughout the uh, 70s, late 70s, 80s, into the 90s. Worked a, a, a lot of cases in Connecticut. Uh, Donnie Brutnell, thank you so much for for joining us. My pleasure. And we're going to tell his story. Um, So, Donnie, before we jump into Connecticut, just to give my hometown Detroiters some love, uh, Donnie, before Donnie got to Connecticut in the late 70s, um, but he started, or he didn't start, he started in Indianapolis and then made his way to Detroit uh, at a time where there was a lot going on, the Jackaloni brothers, Jimmy Hoffa, a changeover in leadership between the uh, you know the old schools, really in Toko, to the new schools, really in Toko. Uh, Donnie, what were your impressions of the Detroit crime family in the in the city in the seventies? It was amazing. Um, when I got, I had worked for a fugitive squad in Indianapolis three year first office agent and stuff. Got to Detroit. And when I got to Detroit, um, I can go on, or, but we're here to the story. I got to Detroit. Neil J. Welch was the SAC yep. in Detroit at that time and known as probably the toughest SAC, but the fairest and the best in the FBI. Um, I went in for my interview as I came into Detroit, and uh, he was sitting there behind the desk with a newspaper up. And I, I couldn't see him. And he says, Tell me about yourself. I mean, <laughs> Tell me about. So I told him, you know, I went to high school, such and such, and he goes, "You're boring me." I went, "Oh, <laughs> and this is not, this is not a good start." So he says, uh, "Get out, go see my secretary." I went, "Whoa!" So I go outside. Secretary Mary was an ex Marine sergeant. So okay. she goes, uh, would, you, "Would you like a cup of coffee?" And I said, "Oh, I sure would." And she, and um, I said, I sure would. And uh, she goes, I'll take cream and sugar. And I went, excuse me? And she goes, you think I'm going to go get your coffee? <laughs> I, go, right. I said, whoa. Here. So anyway, she says. This is Detroit, coming. though. Isn't this? This is like what the, 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 ex- yes. the ex- experience that you just relayed to us is like Detroit is a tough as nails town. They're going to go get your own coffee. It wasn't like Indianapolis. I'll right. tell you that. So anyway, within a couple of minutes, a guy came down, the supervisor, told me, get rid of the tie, get rid of the sport coat, go downstairs, you'll see a, a tan Chevrolet pick you up in the corner, tell you what's going on, see you, you're on my squad, now you're going to be working on organized crime. And that's exactly what happened. So I went out, took my shirt off, got in the car, went around the block with this guy, and he's filling me in. He said, we've got a major investigation going on in, with the Detroit against the Detroit Police Department. Um, there's some corrupt police officers. We've been working for a while. Um, you were going into a bar. You're to go in with me. Just be relaxed, have beers, have a sandwich. Maybe we'll shoot some pool um, and pay attention to this section of the bar because we think that's where the paths are going to be going down, identifying, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going, this, this is unbelievable. So I go in there, and of course we did. We drank, had a few. It was the, uh, I believe it was the Anchor Bar, the name of it. Yeah, it's and, a famous. That's a famous bar that that was uh, that's still around, I think. And it was a big hangout for mob guys, police absolutely. officers, newspaper yep. people, judges, lawyers. That's the place. So we did. I spent it all afternoon in there, and um, you got to remember, <laughs> this was nineteen seventy or something. And the uh, marching orders from Hoover were you, no agent drinks on duty. And I'm thinking, well, somebody told me to drink on duty, so I guess I, you know, so I keep drinking. By the time I got home, man, I was lit up pretty good. And my wife was saying, what the hell is going on here? You know? And I said, welcome to Detroit. This, <laughs> I like this. I like this job. And I said, man. And it took the next day, they kind of debriefed and we went through. But that was my start. From that point on, I was working organized crime pretty much my whole career. Um, in Detroit, I got moved to the surveillance squad 
which again was an innovation created by Neil Welch out of Buffalo office. He started it up there and he moved his, when he came to Detroit, brought that whole concept with him. So we had a offsite, you know, surveillance team, um, dress as you want, you know, hair, whatever you want to do, just get the job done. And um, yeah, so that was how I, I, I got into organized crime. And like I say, I worked at the whole time I was in Detroit. And again, the names you've mentioned, Scott, uh, Zerilli was the power then, uh, the old man and the kid. And then um, the Tocos, of course, and stuff. Our, my focus and a lot of our focus was on the Jack Loans and whether it be Tony or Billy yeah. and, um, uh, you know, concentrating on them. And I had developed a couple of sources, you know, to get closer to them. So a lot of surveillances on them, uh, a lot of uh, going to Greek town, going because uh, they use the Greek uh, muscle down there, the Catronuses and stuff. Yep. Yeah. And uh, it was a, a just a lot of hours, a lot of work. And step back a little bit. The Omnibus Crime Bill had come in in 1968, which gave you know the Title III authority. So now you're talking 71, 72. This was relatively new, but already the bureau was into it at the anchor bar to be in, you know included. Yep. And um, you know so. Uh, it was just uh, one Title Three after another, surveillance backing up the Title Three. So I got to know the state of Michigan pretty quickly. It was good. It was a great time. The, so did did those those trips to Anchor Bar and the um, the wiretaps? Is that what what I think it was? Which was the there was a bust in 1971, I believe. The big one. Uh, that that stemmed out of anchor uh, anchor bar there was actually a tie to my family um and a subsequent murder uh one of the people that got busted there was Sally Shindell who oh, was, I remember that name yeah so Sally was the one that was that. him and Chicky Sherman and Ronnie Morelli and Bobby Lapuma um Bobby Lapuma yeah yeah these were the guys I, I, that were at the anchor bar and that then uh, less than a year later, Sally ended up uh, dead because uh, they thought he was going to talk. Huh. Rip Curry. That's my, guy, my uncle's, or it's my aunt's, uh, uh, My sorry, it's my aunt's brother. Oh, okay. Well, was. Before I was. This is way before I was born. Yeah. But I always yeah. heard stories about Sally. So can you tell us uh, uh, maybe a little bit about the, the Jackalones and, and those sure, guys I that I just mentioned were... Jack Loney lieutenants, Bobby, Ronnie. Yeah, and what happened on the Anchor Bar, you know, is the big case, we took down a, a number of police officers for taking bribes. I mean, we had a, we lived, the surveillance was, actually it's in the, on the other side of the wall with a hole punched in the wall with the camera going in the wall watching the activity at the bar. And uh, seeing payoffs being put in the back pocket of different police officers and stuff like that, had them cold right and then when it came to push the shove the all the attorneys got involved and all the arrests had gone down the thing was kicked out because it was not the law said it had to be signed by the attorney general of the united states okay and i forgot the exact reason but he did not sign it the second in command signed it they threw the whole thing out the whole thing was gone all those cops that take the money and everything that was it they got off you know, but it was, um, that was, a that was awful, but that's what happened because it had not been signed by the attorney general personally. So the title three was out. You, know? you were following around. I know you were following around Billy Jackaloni, And I know that you were one of the people that got him on one of his kind of famous cases where you found a gun in a secret compartment in the car back then. Now the secret compartment shtick is something that's been kind of tried and true but 50 years ago it was a little unique tell us about well, it, it was and and he had the had a source who uh, was a good source obviously and uh advised that um that he was driving around he had a gun on the car and everyone's afraid of billy jackaloni by the way billy jackaloni and, and tony were not nice people and uh uh the fear of them on the street was unbelievable but and then to know that he had a gun right there in the car 
So we got a search warrant for the car. Supposedly it had a button within the dash. All you had to do was hit the button. It would pop down to 38 would be there. So we got the warrant. And I remember when they were in the car, searching the car, couldn't find any button. Now I'm not feeling too good about this search warrant, right? And all of a sudden, one of the techs found a thing, hit it. Down came the tray. In the tray was the gun. We got him. We got him. I'm pretty and, sure I have a picture of that in my first book, Motor City Mafia, shameless plug. I'm pretty sure I have a photo from the FBI that I got. Oh, from really? That exact bust, yeah, with the with a photo of the uh, the compartment yeah. and yeah, yeah. It was, I'll send it, was, it. I'll send it to you when we're done here. Oh, I'm loving it. And then the thing of it is, then I had to go to court and um, and justify the warrant. And of course, we didn't want to give up. Never did give up the source. And um, I was in a different experience with a top mob attorney as a young agent sitting there being grilled. Oof. We got through it. And uh, bye bye, Billy. Yeah, he had to go do some time. Um, before we move to Connecticut, one more. I can't. We can't leave Detroit without uh, mentioning Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah. Uh, what's your uh, recollections of that? And then, and then I'll ask you the final question. Will be what do you think happened to him? And it, yeah. but start with just what the case coming to be. Again, with all the leads uh, popping out of the interviews that were being done by the case agents, then. Um, necessitated a lot of surveillances. So we were doing surveillance on different characters, whether it be the Teamster people, whether it be some of the mob guys, and, and of course, where is he? And just following people here and there and, and trying to put the lead information coming from the case agents to a surveillance where they we could definitively get a great outcome. Um, dealt with Teamsters, dealt with everybody, uh, dealt with uh, the family, um, Jimmy Jr., um, dealt with Mrs. Hoffa, um, dealt with his daughter, you know, and uh, it was a, obviously a very involved case and uh, did a lot of surveillances on the Jackaloni people. And, and again, obviously we did not get the conclusion we wanted, but um, um, a lot of work, a lot of work. And uh, my impression, where is he, you know, um, I'm still of the belief. Well, he, he didn't leave Michigan, right? I, I think any, I think any I think all due respect to Dan Moldea, who I have the just you know I, I can't even put into words how much respect I have for the work that he's done. But I really believe anybody that that really knows knows that he never left Detroit. Go ahead. Did not leave. No way. Who's going to transport a body in any shape, form, or whatever? Take a chance of getting caught. But there's right in the area there. Some of these names I can't remember. It may have been a Vitaly. I'm not sure. He had a home not too far away from the Marcus Red Fox. It was and, uh, Carlo Licata. Okay. There you go. And I think he could have gone there for a meeting to resolve some issues between the Jackalones and Tony Provenzano and all these guys. And, um, you know, under that guise. And, again, he didn't have his bodyguards with him because he's meeting his son. And he didn't need the bodyguards for him. But. They went there, popped him, I think, obviously. And then I think he went to the incinerator. That's where I think he went. Which was um, owned by Vitaly oh, and yeah. Corrado oh. and Jimmy Quasarano. Yep, and I think they took care of it right there. Very quick, neat, done. A lot of talk. They were doing the pilings for the uh, Renaissance Center at that time. And a lot of thing was that they threw him down the piling. You know, mm -hmm. but I mean, there's a thousand ways it could have happened. That's only my estimation of what happened, you know? All right. So let's bring you to New Haven. I know we skipped over Syracuse, but uh, let's just go right to New Haven. Um, when did you get there? I got to New Haven um, they, after, uh, probably 19. Well, I was going back and forth on the Syracuse case, but probably 1979, I was entrenched there. I was feet on the ground and doing stuff. And, and there was obviously, you know, quite a bit of activity percolating there between the Genovese, the Gambinos, uh, the Columbos, I believe also, and uh, the Patriarchos. Yeah. And, and believe it or not, Scott, there's another family working out of the New Britain area, the Cavalcante. Right. The root, the, what they call the Buff Brothers. Yeah. Well, they had Tony, was, Tony the main guy was Pippi Guerrero. Pippi and, Guerrero. Uh, and then, right. The Lasalle so Brothers, they, I think. But 
you're right. When I got there, it was so fractionalized. You had Whitey Tropiano with the Columbus. You had the influence of Raymond Patriarch and the New England people. And then uh, you had the Genovese, um, wherever you, and they had some New Haven, they had some Bridgeport, they, you know, and then uh, uh, Bridgeport was the, the Gambino headquarters, really, and Stanford. They had Fairfield County. Okay. Right. So I'm thinking, wow, there's all these families here. And, and if, yeah, they were getting along. I mean, they were doing all right. But primarily, uh, you had Billy Grasso was up and coming. And he really became up and coming after Whitey Tropiano got popped. Once they took Whitey out, and that was at the behest of uh, Raymond Patriarca in them, you know, uh, they took him out. Billy elevated himself majorly. So he got there goes the that, that influence of the Tropianos. And then was, Tro Rinaldo, was, Tro was Tropiano, what city was he out of? He was pretty much East Haven. East Haven, okay. He, so had, he had a diner right there in East Haven um, he, he, in that area. And again, we're, we're talking gambling, loan sharking. In those days, the football slips. Football slips were huge, right? But it was all, everything seemed to be gambling. The money was coming from gambling for the most part, right? And in New Haven, uh, one of the prominent figures, the Genovese guy, was a guy named Salvatore Nunziato, who was Midgey Renault. Midgey, right. M Midgey Renault was a uh, uh, former boxer, you know, tough, he was a tough guy. And he had control of the New Haven gambling and all that kind of stuff. Although Genovese people in Bridgeport were in charge of the football slips. So they, you know, they brought them in New Haven. There's a lot of money in that. Um, and then in Bridgeport, we'll stick with Genovese. In Bridgeport, it was the Curcios, Fat Franny, his brother Vinny, and then, of course, Gus, right? They, they were the Genovese guys down there. And they had a, a number of other people, some guys in West Haven, blah, blah. And then if you move to the um, Bridgeport Gambinos, then you're talking Frank Piccolo, who was a capo, you know, in the Gambino family. And then he had Nick Patty up in the valley doing gambling. He had people in West Haven, too, doing some gambling. But he was the man. And Tommy DeBreezy, he was a, in a Bridgeport area. Um, then down in Fairfield County, Stanford, with the Gambinos, you had Cosmo Sandalo. Right. An up-and-comer, Tony McGeeley. Uh, and they were all accountable to New York. You I know. didn't realize until recently that uh, Cosmo was Tony McGaley's uncle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was he was the older sto uh, statesman for right. them down there. And he was he took what's his name McGaley under his wing, and then of course McGaley got tied up with drugs and stuff, and that didn't set well, you know. And but yeah, they, it just showed you from from one end of the state to the other there was mob control, but different families. It was amazing. It was amazing. And, um, and of course, <laughs> Piccolo got popped. And uh, that was, we, we, well, we believe it was all on uh, um, Neil Delacroach and uh, Paul Castellano's decision. This was before your time, but Frankie Piccolo was flamboyant Frank, man. Um, the, the clothes, he was the movie guy, he was right out of the movies, right? And he, he spent a lot of time out in LA too. Uh, smooth oh, yeah, smooth yeah. movie stars, yeah, yep. And with uh, what's the name of the singer? Um, we Guido Panisi was his cousin yep. or his cousin and had him out there. Uh, they were feeding, uh, I'm guessing you know, they were feeding cocaine to all of the ABC Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah Piccolo and Panosi. Panosi were uh, feeding the entire ABC studio set with cocaine. That was that. And then he, of course, he was buddy buddies with Wayne Newton, you right. know, and that thing. But Piccolo was too flamboyant. We had wiretaps on him going on, and uh, everyone was afraid he was going to roll. And, you know, that he's not a prison type of guy, you know. And uh, everyone. Everyone. New York was afraid he was going to flip it. And I think that was the main reason 
that he got taken out. And they gave that assignment to uh, Genovese. And it wasn't, wouldn't that be kind of, I mean, from my reporting, that was kind of controversial that they wouldn't do their own house cleaning and absolutely. that they let the Genovese, the allegedly the Curcios and the Hells Angels. Um, Took him out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was, you know, and matter of fact, you know, a guy, John Gotti, from our information, was really pissed that the Genovese took out a capo. He was he was really pissed. And uh, there was a lot of infighting over that decision. Again, Gotti and, and looking at Paulie Castellano, you know, and Neil Delacroix. So there was uh, animosity there. But, yeah, that didn't sit well at all, not at all. And uh, uh, then right after that, um, the individual who thought he was going to take Frank's place, Tommy DeBreezy, Tommy DeBreeze, Tommy DeBreezy, they popped him, and he got found in a trunk in a parking lot in Trumbull, Connecticut. Um, there's, the fam- and- there's that famous uh, soundbite from John Gotti where he says, the only reason he's dying is because he didn't come and see me. That's yeah. it. He did nothing else wrong. It's yeah. kind of a famous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, so it was, now they're gone. The, the power of the uh, Gambinos is Bridgeport gone, right? And now Curcio's, and, and, and of course, New York supporting uh, Gambino. Curcio's take over, and now they got Bridgeport, whatever they want in there, you know. Um so we had a lot of stuff going on, a lot of Title Threes, a lot of surveillances, a lot of interviews. Um, be honest with you, it's fun times, you know. Can you tell time. tell the if you can or if you if you're willing to, uh, can you talk about impressions of? I know Fat Franny is it was a larger than life, literally and figuratively, uh, but he's been gone for a while. Gussie is still around. Uh, oh yeah. Can you tell what what were your impressions of Gussie particularly? Um, as a smart. younger, younger wise guy, smart, smart. He was smarter than Fat Franny, and and well, Vinny was a bondsman, but yeah, he was smarter. Cager, he uh, he he also had a number of um, businesses out there. He had pawn shops. He had um, he still does. Bars. He still he does. Had, huh? He still does. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's got. He's a businessman. He even got into the garbage business for a while. You know, but yeah, so he was one of these guys that knew how to cover his tracks. Um, he used the Hells Angels, you know, and uh, uh, he used them to whack. You no, know, we're, we're convinced it was a, a well, we can just say we can just say allegedly it's not a secret what the feds believed, uh, that who took out Piccolo, uh, Gus was was charged, yes, did. Justin, Gus oh, yeah. and Diamond Dan Byfield, who was the uh, head of the Hell's Angels, was implicated as one of the shooters. It wasn't wasn't charged. He recently died. I don't know if you know that he died a couple weeks ago. Danny uh, Byfield. Danny Byfield died in a. Oh, uh, he was a, uh, he was a vicious guy. Yeah, was a suspect was in quite a few murders. He's a vicious guy. Well, you know, the, the Hell's Angels. There was another guy he, who was a Genovese guy, uh, uh, Tommy the Blonde Vistano. Mm-hmm. Okay, out of Stratford, and he got popped at his doorstep, uh, and that had to be in the eighties, I guess seventy. Yeah, 90s. early. It was early. I think it was early. Yeah, 80s. and uh, again, the problem with he and convinced the the bikers did him for Gus and Franny, right? Um, didn't get proved, but that was the. But he, um, Tommy the Blonde, was older, uh, shaky. He had gotten grand jury subpoena. He had gone to grand jury, um, and he was weak, as they thought, and uh, they were afraid he was going to spill his guts. So he's also the guy that uh, got Midgey Renault to come out that night and get in the ride in car and take a ride. Tommy DeVos. So he knew all about the murder of uh, Midgey. So there's a lot of uh, knowledge there on the part of Tommy DeBlanc that with him talking have been devastating to people. So, but you know, bye-bye Tommy. Isn't but that again, also kind of a common, a common thing? Like debris from what I understand, DeBreezy set Piccolo up. Uh, was the well, guy that made the phone call to get him into the phone. Booth always thought that, always thought that Scott, 
uh, always thought it, that he made the call and said, you're going to get a call from New York. They want to settle things here. Bing, bing, t- you know, yeah. and that's where they knocked him out of the phone booth. You know? Well, let's but, talk a little bit about the uh, the rise of Billy Grasso. Um, and that must have been, you know, that wasn't New York, but that was quite the uh, fireworks display uh, in, in the late 80s with him rising to power, becoming the underboss, killing a bunch of people on his own, and then getting killed by his own by by his own people in the middle of a war. Right. B- Billy um, started being in prison with, with uh, Raymond Patriarca, right? As we used to say, he was polishing his shoes. And then they made that contact, and, and then we were convinced he set up the hit on Whitey Tropiano. There's a famous photo. It, I, we introduced it in our trial, I think, but it, it's a photo, New York City, in the rain, Billy Grasso holding an umbrella over Tony Salerno's head as they're walking down the street, right? So now you're putting uh, New England uh, family, Patriarca, holding the umbrella for the big Genovese guy, right? So... That, that that tie right there, the Genovese and, and them were getting along, the patriarchs. So, but Billy, uh, he became real powerful after Whitey went with all the gambling and all the kind of stuff and stuff. And when when he really got, uh, there's so much going on here, the really exploded for Billy is um, there was uh, Boston, not, I'm jumping way ahead now, but Boston in the late 80s um, was making a move with uh, this guy Russo and yeah. getting their power base. Billy wanted his, down, he had to get an army down in Connecticut because he's afraid of them. They're afraid of him. And that's when they they uh, took out, what well, tried to take out Frankie Cadillac, Salemi, and Grasso at the same time. But um, always assumed that Billy's power came from the fact that there was a guy, and I believe Scott, his name is Johnny Vitano. It's it's going back a while. He's deceased now. He died of cancer. But I think he was a part of the hit on Piccolo with Curcio. Okay. Okay. Somehow he has something to do with that. Anyway, the Genovese books were closed. No new members. So Billy trying to build his army he has a meeting out at this guy, Billy Grant's place out in uh, Madison. Hot dog, hot dog, Billy Grant. Yeah, or Westbrook, I guess, yeah, to make his army. So they in, had a, 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 introdu- a, a doc, what do you call it? A, a induction ceremony. Induction ceremony for like seven guys. And what Billy did, he brought Vitano in, he became a made guy, as a favor to the Genovese because their books were closed. That gave him all he needed to get along with Springfield, New York, everything. You know, do what you want, Billy, Connecticut yours. You got that. Take it. And he did. He did take it. Um, but um, uh, the so they had the making ceremony. And then, um, we're jumping right ahead, I mean, that's the one where Gaetano Milano, was the, the guys under Billy, it's hard to for people to, the guys under Billy, closest people, anybody, was terrified that he'd get pissed off one day and kill you. Right. I mean, crazy man. They call him crazy guy. And they were, so everyone had that on their mind. If I fuck up, I, I'm gone. Right. So when Russo said, we got to take him out, told Gaetano, you get him done or we'll take you out. You know, so not many options at that point. So that Gaetano uh, is the guy that shot him. They had Louis Pugliano driving the van. You talk about a mess. I mean, they, you talk about the gang that couldn't sh- shoot straight. It was, it was pathetic. It was unbelievable. They had a, a backup car that was supposed to, was supposed to pop Billy, drive down to the, the Connecticut River in the, this area, drive down this road, throw the body out, the backup car come in, pick up the body, get rid of the body, put it in the river, and do whatever you got to do. Right? Well, they got lost. <laughs> they didn't. They couldn't. They missed. Where'd they go? Right? That's Sonny Castagna. 
So they, right. here goes the van now. They're driving up 91 at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. 1 o'clock. Billy sitting in the driver's, in the passenger seat. Louis Pug's driving. Gaetano getting his ass chewed by Billy in the, in the ride for screwing up with bookmaking, just chewing his ass out, right? And they're going up there. So finally, he just slides down, picks up the gun. In the middle of the day, 91 North, he pops him right behind the ear. Now, that could have blown blood all over the windshield, could have, whatever. I mean, right? The bullet just, you know, I don't know. Really, no blood, no nothing. Jackie Johns was in the van, grabbed Billy by the hair, pulled him back like he's sitting upright in the car. They continue up, do a U-turn up in Hartford, come down 91, go over, throw the body out, thinking the backup's there, and off they go. Uh, uh, it, it, it was just a uh, you know, game that couldn't straight, shoot straight. But Billy's dead, and everyone's pretty happy. Could you talk a little bit, if you know, about uh, so in the it, Billy's killed in uh, summer of eighty nine, June of eighty nine. Yep. Um, but there were a couple murders of guys around him in the year or two leading up to this. Yep. Uh, and if you have any insight, we'd love to hear it. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, Hot dog Grant, who we just talked about before. He um, went- he died. Well, he was killed in May of '88. Uh, yeah, he was and, on his. Uh, he had his kid had a college graduation party or something and didn't show yeah. up. And Billy was, they we, Billy had a name, uh, East Side West Side, you know, um, on the East Side of Hartford where he lived. And he he was like, uh, you know, the little league coach. Um, they the go to church type thing with the family, the family guy, the family guy. And he owned the, the famous, uh, uh, he owned the famous uh, hot dog place, right? Augie, yeah, Augie and Ray's. Augie and Ray's. Augie and Ray's. And then on the other side, he, he was the mob guy. You know, across the river, get the west side of night, he's mob stuff, Billy. And he ran, he was a tough guy. He ran the gambling over there. And, uh, but he also had been uh, like Grasso. He got the responsibility of taking care of Persico. Um, Alley Alley Boy. Boy. Yeah. He hid out in West Hartford for years, right? And um, and, uh, so Billy was the conduit grant to get him the money from New York to Bobby Grasso, Grasso to Grant, Grant to Alley Boy. You know, that was his job. Well, a couple of things happened. Um, one, Billy's grand juries were going on, the good old grand juries. Again, these guys don't like the grand juries because they think everybody's giving it up, right? So they had grand juries going on. And at the same time, the, the marshal service did a phenomenal job uh, of tracking through driver's licenses and numbers. They identified him and they got Persico, right? The marshals did. Well, per- Persico thought that Billy through the grand jury or whatever, he'd given him up, right? Dimed him. So he had to go. And the guy who was responsible for Billy Grant, Billy Grasso. Yeah. Billy Grasso, he takes care of it. And never found um, exactly thought, where. Uh, yeah, the, the people thought they might have found him uh, under a house, but they never knew for sure. In the garage. Right. In a garage in Hamden. And that's the other guy we're going to talk about. I named Salvatore Caruana. Salvatore Caruana was out of Rhode Island. He's a big marijuana guy. In those days, that was big money. He's a big marijuana guy. And he was on the lam in Connecticut. Same thing. He was, his uh, babysitter was uh, Sal Tequila, Butch Tequila. And he took the money and got the monies and stuff to him. From Billy Grasso. Billy Grasso, that same thing, only uh, different families. And what happened, he was a pain in the ass uh, to Grasso. Caruana, Grasso did not like him, didn't want him in his state. But what happens is. Patriarcha liked it. Patriarcha liked him because he was a big money maker. Oh, yes. Yeah. But Patriarcha was dead by that point. Yep. But Junior and them around and Maddie and stuff. So what happens is. Um, 
Carolina finds out that this guy who's the hockey coach for his kids back home is, right. is banging his wife. Right. Right. Teddy Burns, his name was. So that's a no, no. And, and in the, in the monster thing, you know, you don't mess around with a guy's wife and all that bullshit. So that justified Billy doing what he had to do. Plus he didn't like him. So they had a setup type thing. And first thing they did is Carolina involves Billy directly with getting rid of Teddy Burns' body. Brings him in the trunk of a car, goes to Billy's house. He says, hey, you got to help me out. I got a body here. Well, <laughs> you know, so he's, you know, he's going to go <laughs> sooner or later for doing that. But so that what they did is they uh, got the body, took the body to a garage um, in um, uh, New Haven. And it was a dirt garage thing. And they, they go in there, and they, in, in this particular one, they had uh, Jackie Johns was there and a couple other people. I forgot who, well, Billy, obviously. Uh, Beetle, they own the house. And they're, they're doing the thing, the digging. And Billy looks up, and he sees Jackie Johns just kind of moving the shovel, you know? And, he, you know, you better start fucking digging, because if you don't, you're going in there next. Yeah, I mean, just got in the shovel, you know, get the thing out. So in goes Teddy Burns. And when we finally found out where that burial site was, they got three different thyroid thyroid bones out of there. My, I don't know this for a fact, but I assume it's Midget Renault, Sal Caruana, and Grant. That's who I think was in the, in the hole because there were three bodies in there. And when they dug it up, the main body you know the skull the hip bones and all that were gone so they knew the heat was on through our investigation i think they dig them dug them up got the big parts out but they still didn't get the digital you know the finger type things and the thyroids yeah so it's a lot of shit going on last question about connecticut yep B billy miller do you know the? do you remember the billy miller story the boxer billy. The what? Oh, oh, Eric Miller. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm confused. Eric Miller. I don't know why I said Billy because we're Billy Grasso, Billy Grant. Sorry. Too Eric many Billys Miller. here. Too yeah, many Eric, I meant Eric Miller, the Eric Miller story. Yep. And that was the biggest tragedy. And, and one of the things I can tell you right now, Scott, of things I worked on in the not being able to definitively solve that. Just just as his father was the nicest man. And actually, Eric was not a bad kid, but. Uh, all the stuff's going on. Jackie Johns, Billy, they're out Billy's restaurant putting plants in, you know. So Eric comes, all he does is go, he's buddies with Jackie Johns, drives by, and he, he makes the comment that planting flowers, planting trees, that's all you guineas are good for, right? right? Well, Grasso goes nuts, you know, and starts yelling at uh, Eric Miller, you know. And they were playing. They were play, they were playing around, right? Like Eric yeah, Miller oh, yeah, was, yeah, I, was yeah. Irish, oh, was an Irish guy. Johns yeah. was an Italian guy, and they were joking around. And and Billy Grasso was not uh, down with the way they were joking. Exactly. Oh, there's no exactly what it was. And they're, as they say, fucking around, right? And right. so Billy takes a swing. He's got scissors too, or uh, you know the clippers there, and he takes a swing at Eric. Well, Eric's a boxer. Right? He's a boxer. He, defensively, boom, he pops him. And down goes Billy. Knocked him right down. Now, boom. And with that, Sonny Castagna was there, Jackie's father. And Jackie, and they look at Aaron and say, you know who this is? You know what you just did? And he goes, what? You know who that guy is? And he didn't. So they tell him, he said, get the hell out of here. He goes. Over the next couple months, Billy says, look, I, I, I know this kid uh, didn't mean it. I know he befriends them. They're going to get into renovating apartments together. Billy's going to help them with some money. Everything's going good. New Year's Eve, boom, in a, a freaking parking lot in Hartford. They put a bunch of – and I, my opinion, Jackie Johns. Jackie Johns. He brought them there in effect, right? Right. So it's up to him to do it. And uh, poor Eric didn't, didn't do Jack, and he got 
shot for him because of Billy. That's what Billy was like. I think they had phone records that night of Jackie. Calling oh yeah, they, they, Billy. he called his girlfriend. Not Billy. I keep on saying Billy. I'm sorry. Calling Eric. God. <laughs> sorry. It, it's all over. It was all over drug debt, right? That they set up and stuff. And he told Eric at that point, "Look, we got this. Settle this thing on the debt. The money owes. I'll meet you at such." And it was a call, like you said, in there. Got him out. Went went up in the, the parking lot there, and that's where they shot him. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Donnie, this was awesome. Hopefully, we 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 we'll bring you back on, and we can talk about some more stuff and tell some more war stories. Um, Next time, the, I'll tell you about our following Piccolo to New York. Yes, please, and we'll do it maybe sooner than later. That, uh, if, that was, if you're down before the holidays, oh, that's, uh, that's fine. That's fine. Donnie, yeah. thank you so much. Like I said, we pay a debt and uh, uh, owe a debt, I should say. I mean, all the all this. Uh, uh, Freudian Freudian slips. Yeah. Um, we owe a debt to guys like you who who put in the work for for decades, uh, doing stuff that uh, people only can really understand if they watch movies like it. People yeah. don't get the type of work you do and how much how much of yourself you have to give. Well, I'll tell you, your podcast is bringing a lot of it to, you know, out up front and people hear about it. And uh, you're doing a great job. Like I said, I've listened to them and uh, I listened to your one on Hoff and stuff, too. And um, it's very interesting. It, and you do, Scott, not, not blowing smoke here. You, Thank you. You, you, you got a lot of knowledge and you use it well. Thank you. you got to preserve the history and uh, absolutely that's what we're doing here so um detroit you, you live there now You're i do i do i was in chicago for a decade and now i'm in detroit and uh we're, we're making a major comeback man you should come see the city it's that's like, what everyone tells me well i'm watching see when i was there all the sports were downtown right and now they're back now they're back down then now they left and back. now they're back downtown and they all boy, left what a difference, what right. a difference. i lived in troy Right, yeah. I'm, I'm 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 five ten minutes from Troy. Yeah, yeah, we used oh. to call it Hoover Hill. <laughs> All the feds were over there. Yeah, yeah, that was a Levitt, one of those new Levitt home things. Yep. And uh, yeah, so there's so many agents there. We call it Hoover Hill. Well, thank you, Donnie. Thank you, uh, everybody uh, in the audience. These are the kind of interviews that we love giving you. This is an exclusive. Donnie's never uh, really gone gone on any podcast and, and told his story, and we're going to be bringing him back. Please like, subscribe, share, spread the word. Scott Bernstein for Donnie, for Benny Behind the Glass, OG Pod, we're out.